All right, so today we continue our hypothesis testing. Um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to review hypothesis testing. We're going to go a little bit more in depth to like what exactly a p-value is, because yesterday we kind of like glossed over, um, glossed over that definition. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple more tests. So we're going to talk about one sample and two sample t-tests today, um, as well as finally talk about type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, Oh, there's a, nice. I'm surprised that I remembered all of that. So yeah, hypothesis testing review, p-values. Oh, we're also going to talk a little bit about um, effect sizes. Really quick definition, because effect sizes does come back um, in, I, I want to say, topic 15 or 16. Um, effect sizes is something that um, we'll talk about with A-B testing, whichever one that is. And then we'll talk about two more tests. Uh, both of them I have examples to go with. and then at the end, type one and type two errors. So just to start, this is our statistical testing process. Um, just to remember, every single statistical test that we do will follow this process. So what we're gonna do with our t-tests later on, uh, we're gonna, again, set up our hypotheses. Um, and again, based on the test, the hypotheses might look a bit different, but these should look pretty similar to the one that we did yesterday. We're gonna be picking the statistical test, picking your alpha, calculating your test statistic, p-value, and then interpret. All statistical tests follow this process. So to start, what is a p-value? Um, so p-values are actually going to be one of the main things that you will be interpreting um, once we get into modeling. So it's a really important definition to at least either conceptually remember or like by definition remember. So a p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic at least as large as the one observed by random chance, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So um, just to put that in like a different context, that might be a little bit more understandable. Yesterday, we talked about a situation where, um, you know, we were comparing IQ, IQ scores of people who were tutored to the population that wasn't tutored. So now we got a p-value yesterday of 12% of 0.12. And I'll again talk about like how we derive the p-value in these other contexts, but the value that we were comparing to our alpha was 12%. That 12% by the p-value definition means that there is a 12% chance that this group of people could have higher IQs by random. So there's a random chance, there's a 12% chance that um, it just so happens to be that those 40 students have higher IQs. So that's why we want to get, we're usually looking for lower p-values to confirm an effect. So let's say, you know, instead of 12%, let's say our p-value for that exact problem was 0 0.01. If it was a 1% p-value, that's saying that there's only a 1% chance that um, this group of students were just smart by random. So it sort of confirms that um, your hypothesis, your null hypothesis wasn't rejected just by coincidence. Because gotcha. it could be a coincidence that like, you know, in your sample of 40, you just happened to tutor the students that were already smart. And so that um, p-value just looks at what is the probability of that being random. Um, and again, um, we will look at this um, in context of different hypotheses too. But questions about this? This is a pretty important uh, definition to remember. All right. Next up, effect size. And effect size, um, I'm going to talk about pretty briefly. We're not going to talk about it too much for the rest of this um, for the rest of this study group, but it just so happens that it's included in the topic materials. Um, but the effect size measures the difference between two groups. And it's something that is sort of standardized. So in a way, we can get this, um, this statistic of Cohen's D that measures the difference between two groups. Um, and it also does that in terms of the number of standard deviations. And I'll talk about an example really quick after I talk about this next part, which is that it's measured from zero to one. And just by like guidelines, a small effect size is 0.2, medium 0.5, large 0.8. Uh, those are just like um, numbers that people usually go off of, um, but of course it does depend on context whether an effect size is big or not. 
So effect size, it measures the difference between two groups um, in terms of the number of standard deviations. So what that means is, let's say we're measuring test scores. Um, so if you're measuring test scores, you have, let's say two classes, one that has an average of 75 and one that has an average of 80. Um, of course, the difference, the absolute difference between the two test scores is five. But we wanna know like, all right, is the five point difference a big difference or small difference, right? We don't exactly, just by using the averages, the averages of the two groups, um, we can't really say or contextualize what this five point difference is. So what it means by like, you know, we're considering the number of standard deviations. Um, if the standard deviation of, you know, your grades is, let's say 20. So that means if your standard deviation of grades is 20, means that, you know, your grades are pretty widespread across the scale of, let's say like zero to 100. Um, a difference of five means less than if the standard deviation was like five. Does that make sense? So if, you know, the results are less spread out, um, the magnitude of the difference would in relation be bigger than if the results were more spread out. Would that be kind of similar as to finding the standard error of standard deviation? Because I saw in the stack request video, you could do that too. Yeah, actually, yeah. So standard error, um, I would say is pretty similar because in the calculation of COSD, which I think I have a formula, not in this slide deck, but the next one, I think that in the calculation of COSD, it's a very similar formula. If not, is it the same? it's not the same, but it's very, very similar formula to the standard error formula. So I would say, yeah, it's similar. But yeah, we will come back to this and we will actually like have, I think a, I would, I wanna say it's an A-B testing example or like a control and experiment group example where we actually make use of this number. Yeah, I heard, I think someone was about to yeah. speak. And effect size is opposite to p-value in terms of a standard deviation? Um, Opposite to p-value in terms of standard deviation. You mean by, you mean by like the, um, the effect size number would increase with a small standard deviation versus how a, the number of p-value goes? Yeah, I mean, effect size uh, shows us how different sample means are, right? Mm -hmm. But the p-value is the prob probability of sample means if they are the same or not, right? Ah, uh, okay. I get what you mean. I get what you mean. I think it's confusing because these slides come one after another, but they're kind of describing different things. So your first part was correct. The effect size does measure the difference between sample means. P-value, um, it depends on the context in which you're calculating p-value. So actually, yeah, it could be measuring like, um, later, we'll see in a two-sample t-test, we're actually going to calculate a p-value for a two-sample t-test. And if your p-value is small, it means that they're very different. Um, so p-values, how you interpret a p-value in context does depend on the context. Um, whereas effect size is straight up difference between the two means always. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? All right. Okay, so that's p-value. This is effect size. We're gonna move on to doing two different kinds of testing. So first we're gonna do a one sample t-test and then we're gonna do a two sample t-test. I will say that these are the tests that um, are the most widely used. Um, we'll sort of see why. And then also um, I'll talk about um, how, if you want, you can incorporate this in your projects. So first start with a one sample t-test. Um, it's very, very similar to what we did yesterday with our one sample Z test. Um, the information that we need in this case though, uh, we only need your population mean um, and your sample data. And the population mean doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you go out and measure every single thing in the population and get a mean. Population mean can be an assumed number. For example, with yesterday's example, um, when we were talking about IQs, and we had like the population mean IQ being 100, that is not a number that we got from, you know, testing everybody's IQ and like using every result from every IQ test taken and taking the average, but that, that is just like an assumed value. 
if that makes sense. That's like something that I think is important to to like conceptualize that we don't actually know the population. I mean, that's just a value that we're testing against, which I think will make a little bit more sense with this example. So in this example, here we have a um, sample question. This one is actually from one of the lessons. So Acme Limited wants to improve sales performance. Um, past sales data indicates that the average sale was $100 per transaction. And after training, recent sales data is shown below. And they have this, here we have just like 25 numbers. And what they want to do is to see whether, you know, the training actually helped or did not help. So very, very similar setup as the last question that we did yesterday, um, where, you know, a group of students are tutored. We want to see if, you know, they're, they actually have a higher IQ or not. Um, so that's the setup of the question. Any questions with this setup? Really, the only difference between this question and yesterday's question is yesterday's question, we were provided with a population standard deviation. Um, and in this case, we don't. Yesterday, I like kind of alluded to like the T distribution and how you use that when you don't have the population standard deviation. And um, the reason why T tests are used more than Z tests is because a lot of times you just don't have that population standard deviation. Um, so yeah. All right, so this is our setup. Um, we're going to go through the exact same um, process of statistical testing, starting with our hypotheses. So over here, what we're doing is we're testing against the mean of 100. And so our null hypothesis is that, all right, the mu of our sample is 100. And our alternate hypothesis is that mu is greater than 100. Again, this is a one-tailed test because here they want to see um, an improvement in sales performance. So that's why we're doing a one-tailed test. Um, I will say it can be argued that you might want to do a two-tailed test here, but um, that's only because they don't have like an explicit statement saying, are people being trained making higher sales? But that's kind of going off on a tangent here. Let's just use a one-tailed test for this. We have our hypotheses here. Um, we've chosen, we know that it's a one-sample t-test. And as usual, we'll set our alpha at 0.05. So these are the numbers that we have. Um, here we have the mu, which is uh, 100. We have our number of people in our sample, n, which is 25. Um, our x bar, which is the sample mean. Our sample mean actually comes up to 109. So this is just, so x bar and s, which is sample standard deviation, these numbers were calculated using um, these numbers here from this array. So 109 with a standard deviation of 13. The degrees of freedom, because we need degrees of freedom for a t-test, um, is 24 in this case. That's because degrees of freedom usually is just one, uh, sorry, it's n minus one. So 25 minus one, which is 24. Degrees of freedom is denoted by df, which I know is confusing because we use df for data frame. But you might see df, um, should I mention this now or later? Um, in some of the coding questions, you might see an argument called DDOF. I don't know if anyone's come across that yet. So DF means degrees of freedom. DDOF means delta degrees of freedom. So delta degrees of freedom basically is like how many are you minusing away from N? So usually in your labs, you probably see DDOF equals to one. So that's what that means if anyone was wondering. Um, but same thing, DDOF will automatically take N minus whatever DDOF you give and calculate degrees of freedom that way. And we put uh, DDOF equals to one because we want to have a standard normal distribution? Um, they put DDOF equals to one because we are estimating, because it goes into how degrees of freedom works, but it comes from how many parameters are we testing. Um, so here, if we're just testing for, um, if we're just testing for mu, um, we just minus one. We'll see other cases, I think on, I want to say either on Monday or Tuesday, no, Tuesday or Wednesday, um, we'll see cases where we actually want to have DDOF equals to two. And I think if we're doing a two sample t-test, um, DDOF becomes two, but we'll see that. We'll see those in the coming slides. 
But yeah, that's a good question. Uh, DDoS is typically one if you're doing a one-step application, and I believe two. I need to like see what the slide says. I don't remember off the top of my head, but but yeah. Uh, there is a great stat quest video that explains how DDoS is calculated, so I will find that and send that out too. Um, so cool. These are all the numbers that we have to calculate. Next, we have to calculate our test statistic. So our test statistic, this is not the greatest formatting, but the T statistic is what we're going to use for the one sample T test. The T statistic is calculated using this formula over here, um, which is not super clear, but it says X bar minus mu divided by S over square root of N. So also actually very similar form looking formula to the Z score. And with that calculation, it gives us a T statistic of 3.5781. So the way that T tests work is slightly different from Z tests in terms of what values you're looking up. Um, we had a very, very similar graph as yesterday here. So this is a graph of the T distribution. And with this T distribution graph centered at zero, what I like to do first is when we calculate our T statistic, just imagine like where that is. So I actually start with this red line here. All right, where is our T statistic at? So knowing that, the part that is different between a t-test and a z-test is with a z-test, we get the z-score and we actually look up the probability. Right? We look at the probability of that z-score or the p-value. The thing that's different for here is you're actually taking your alpha. So with a t-test, you're going to take your alpha and then look up a critical t-value. So that's a slight difference. Whereas yesterday, you know, we were actually comparing the area under the graph. Here, we're straight away just calculating thresholds. So I'll explain because we have this t-table over here, how we use this t-table. And let me see if there's a better t-table I have linked here. All right, I have the t-table over here and let's go back to this. All right, the way we use our t-table, it depends on our alpha and what our hypothesis are. So back here, our alpha was 0 0.05, and our hypothesis was a uh, one-tailed test. The way the t-table works, and let me, let me see if I can zoom in a little better. The way the t-table works is you actually look up the alpha and the number of degrees of freedom to determine your threshold. So to do that, our degrees of freedom happen to be 24, and our alpha was a one-tailed test 0.05. So we're going to look up this column for 24 degrees of freedom. So if we scroll down here, um, we get a critical T of 1.711. So we have a critical T of 1.711. Yikes. What we're going to do then is we're going to compare our critical T to our T statistic. And that's why I like to use this diagram because um, in this diagram, I just write down where the p statistic is, which was 3.57, somehow shade in um, 1.711. I believe that this, yeah, this is, I think, two scale. Not sure if this is two scale, but we can estimate that this is about 1.711. Um, as long as the red line is to the right of the green line, as long as it surpasses our critical value, we can reject the null hypothesis. And so what we're doing here is we want to compare if um, you know, these group of people who went through training are making higher sales. So this is the threshold here. This green line is a threshold. As long as your red line goes past this green line, they have made statistically significantly better sales. Questions about this? All right. Oh, it's, oh. it's kind of similar to what we looked at yesterday, but just a different way to do it when you don't know the population standard deviation. Yep, it's very, very similar um, test. And I guess like you can kind of actually, yeah, you would interpret it in a, in a very similar way um, with this green line here being um, 1.711. The area under here is also 0.05. Okay. Um, so that's another way to look it up. Um, there is also a way to calculate the p-value for this t-statistic over here. And actually, when you do it in Python, it will actually give you the p-value over here. The p-value being the area to the right of this red line. So we can actually say we will, if you were to do the calculation, the p-value here will actually be very, very small. 
which is a good thing to reject the null hypothesis. So because of this, we can say that, you know, statistically significantly, um, the people who went through the training uh, make higher sales. Cool, anything else? Because after this, we're gonna move on to a two sample t-test. Great, so the p-value for the critical t-value would mm -hmm. be 0 0.05? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? All right, um, now we're gonna move on to two sample t-test. And I also took this example, because I think this is a very common example. Um, this is from the lessons as well. So um, when you're doing like controlled, like controlled experiments, like for example, drug tests, um, you like to have like an experimental group and a control group. So in, in, I guess, medical context, I don't know too much about this, but you would give like half, half your people like a placebo drug and half your people the real drug and then just compare to see, you know, how, um, I guess, depending on what the drug is testing for, like whether there's any difference between the two groups. So here, um, this example here, we're looking at systolic blood pressure. Um, and it was given to 50 out of 100 people in this experiment. So here you can see um, that there are 50 subjects in a control group that have an average systolic blood pressure of 121 who have gotten a placebo drug. And then there's 50 subjects in an experimental slash treatment group that they were given the actual drug and they have a blood pressure of 111.56 after treatment with the drug being tested. So basically here, actually it actually puts it very well over here, the apparent difference between the two groups is uh, 9.82 points, but how confident can the researcher be that this measured difference is real or statistically significant? We just wanna see if the, the 9.8 point difference um, is a significant difference between these two groups. So that's our setup. Does anyone need to clarify anything? All right, so for this, we use a two sample t-test. When we want to control, uh, when we want to compare two groups or two samples with each other, we're using a two sample t-test. So before when we we're doing one sample z-test or t-test, we're comparing one sample to some population, but here we're just comparing two samples to each other. So that's the key difference between one sample and two sample. All right, to set up, hypotheses slightly different because we're not comparing to a population parameter. So here the hypothesis, and you might see this differently, but let me first highlight the hypotheses over here. Um, the null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 equals to zero. You might see this as mu1 equals to mu2 in some places, um, so just want to make a note of that means the same thing. Um, but I think in like statistic textbooks, it shows up this way. Um, so null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 equals to zero, basically meaning that the means of the two groups have no difference. The alternate hypothesis here is mu1 minus mu2 is not equals to zero, meaning that there is a difference. Um, so this is, I, I, this is the first instance that we're seeing a two-tailed test because here in the question, they don't say that whether the drug for sure will decrease blood pressure. Um, and they're not saying that, they're not explicitly stating that the drug will definitely lower blood pressure. Maybe there's a chance that there's, I don't know, something wrong with the drug and could actually raise blood pressure. So we actually want to see if there's a difference, not just if there's an increase or decrease. Um, and again, like the way you think about these, you really have to like nitpick the wording of the question sometimes. Um, but yeah, so these are our hypotheses. Um, if we move down here, um, we can see that our alpha is set at 0 0.05. And what that actually means in a two-tailed test is we're actually splitting it on both sides, splitting it to either side. So whereas with a one-tailed test, and actually let me go back to that so we can compare what those look like. If we go back to here, a one tilt test has a critical T value here and the area here is 0 0.05, our alpha. In a two tilt test, it's sort of split up. Um, I wish I could zoom in a little bit more, but basically when it's split up, what I mean by that is that the area under, let's say the area on the right here, the area out here 
is actually 0 0.025. And on the other side, 0 0.025. So you have rejection regions on both sides. Uh, null hypothesis rejection regions on both sides, but the both sides will add up to 0 0.05. So that's just something that's a little bit different with two-tailed tests. Um, so your critical T will be different for a one-tailed and a two-tailed test. Um, so numbers to calculate. This is actually how we calculate our T statistic. I think I mentioned yesterday that like with more complicated tests, our um, T statistics get more and more complicated. So this is the formula. Good news is you never have to remember it or use it because there is a library in Python that does it for you. Um, but the numbers that we have and that we will calculate is um, first over here we have our sample, we have our sample info. So right over here, this is the information that I took from um, that I took from the setup of the question. And I actually think that in in this setup of the question in your labs, they actually give you the 50 blood pressure numbers. And so because of that, you can actually also calculate the sample, uh, the sample standard deviation. So this is numbers that we have. We have these means, we have these um, number of people in the sample. Um, and then you basically have to have these formulas. Um, just to like break down these formulas just a little bit, this is a T statistic for a two sample T test. You can see here that you're taking into account the X bar one, X bar two, basically the means of the two samples. Um, you're taking into account the number of people in each sample. So actually in each sample, you can have a different number of people and that's fine. And here you have a pooled sample variance. Um, variance because there's a square. Um, without the square, it's the standard deviation. Pooled sample variance is calculated with another complicated formula. So this SP squared part, you'd actually plug into here. Um, basically sample variance is a measure of your variance across both, is a way to measure your variance across both groups. Not super important to remember uh, what that means. But after calculating all of this, we do end up with a two sample T statistic here of negative 1.891. So these are the numbers that we've calculated. Question so far. Main thing to note is these formulas look super complicated, but basically we're doing the same thing that we've done before, which is calculate a T statistic. All we did was just use more formulas to calculate this T statistic for this kind of test, um, of which we can code in one line in Python, so don't worry about it. But with that, we get our t-statistic of negative 1.891. So now that we have our t-statistic of negative 1.891, we're going to take a very similar process as we did with the one sample t-test and compare it to critical t's. So over here, um, this is what the diagram sort of looks like. And if you look up the t-table for two tails and two tails 0 0.05, meaning 0 point, two tails at 0 0.05, meaning on each side is not point, 0 0.025, basically this column. I'm not sure what numbers I just said earlier. But here, 0 0.05. Um, one other thing to notice is remember, as I said, the more degrees of freedom you have, the more similar it is to a normal distribution. Um, if you were to scroll down, because we also have to look at degrees of freedom here, um, Degrees of freedom is n minus one. Here in this case, this degrees of freedom table, you can see it goes from like one all the way to 30, and then it starts going to 40, 60, 80, 100, 1,000. That's because, you know, as it's getting bigger, you can sort of estimate, and the um, t statistic um, doesn't actually have such a big difference. So you can sort of see between like 30 and 40, um, the difference is like only 0 0.02 over here. I forget which column we were looking at. This column, yeah, that's right. So for our purposes, we sort of um, round, I forget if we round up or round down, but yeah, I guess we round, I don't think it matters too much, but uh, we have 50 people in each sample. Uh, so we have, a t, we have a critical T statistic of about two, because we have 50 in each group here. Your T statistic is about two. So here we can estimate that, all right, our t-statistic is roughly 2.0 on each side, plus minus 
And then we just compare those critical t-values to our calculated t-statistic. So what we had here, um, these black lines are our critical values. And this red line is where our t-statistic is. And as you can see, our t-statistic of negative 1.89 actually falls within the non-rejection region. So therefore, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and the drug does not make a difference in blood pressure levels. In other words, that like 9.8 difference in the blood pressure levels in the two groups, not significant enough for the drug to have an effect. Um, and also, here is the one line code that you can use. Um, it's from, I think SciPy has like a sub library called stats, where you have this like t-test underscore ind. Uh, I think that stands, I think IND stands for independent, where you literally just give it the two arrays of your numbers and it spits out the T statistic here of negative 1.89 and your P value. And so with the code here, it spits out the P value. And knowing that you have an alpha setup of 0 0.05, all you have to do is look for whether the P value is above or below 0 0.05. So this actually makes it even easier because we don't have to look up anything with the one line code. Um, p value 0 0.06. Um, if your alpha is 0 0.05, you'll be like, all right, 0 0.06 is greater than that, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. However, if you set an alpha of 10%, maybe instead your alpha is 0 0.1, um, this will then fall below your alpha, and then you would reject your null hypothesis. So that just goes to show your choice of alpha just determines you know, how strict your test is. If you want to be extremely sure that this drug works, you would want your um, you would want to set an alpha that's lower. So let's say maybe this drug like has a lot of risks, but for some people it manages to really lower their blood pressure, but it has a lot of like you know I don't know collateral risks involved. You want to be extremely sure that the drug works. So you maybe want to set an alpha of like one percent, and then if you get a p value of below one percent, that's great. Um, you can um, reject your null hypothesis. The drug actually really works. And what that p-value of like below 1% is saying is that there will be a below 1% chance that, you know, those people have a lowered blood pressure by random. So that sort of brings back the uh, definition of the p-value. Does that make sense? All right. Um, Ask a question? Mm-hmm. Um, when you looked at the t-statistic in the table, you used degrees of freedom, but what if we had two different sample sizes? You said, you know, what if one was 50 and one was only 30 or something like that? Yeah. Um, with those, I believe the rules are you go with your, I want to say you go with your smaller one. I will have to look it up to confirm. I haven't thought about this in a while, but I'll look up and I'll confirm. But I think the rule is you go with your smaller one so that you end up with a lower or higher critical value. But I'll, I'll look it up and I'll confirm it with you um, later today. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, cool. Anything else about t-test? This is the end of our t-test section and we're going to talk about type 1, type 2 errors in a little bit. Uh, Matthew had a question in the chat. Ooh, yeah. Thanks for flagging that. Let's see. Is it reasonable to do double alpha if you decide to do a t a two-tailed test instead of one tail. By that, do you mean like, you know, if here we're doing like this blood pressure drug, you want to have like a different alpha on like the high end and the low end? Is that what you mean? Let's see, Matthew here. If that is what you meant, then I actually don't know too much about that. Um, double alpha. Oh, I see now. Is it reasonable to double your alpha value when you want to do a two-tail test instead of one-tail test? Got it. I like misinterpreted it for a while. But I think the question is asking that um, if you have a two-tail test instead of a one-tail test, because we end up splitting um, the alpha across both sides, um, would it make sense to you know, double your alpha value so that you can still have 5% on each side? Um, I don't see why not. I think this comes down to more of like experimental design. And this is when you really have to think in context of your problem, which is like um, knowing that it's a two-tailed test, if you want to be like more strict or less strict, um, that can just de determine your alpha. Um, but 
the more important part is you should be d defining your alpha before you even calculate your test statistics so that you know your setting of alpha is not biased by that. But I think the answer to that really depends on context. To me, yeah, it makes sense because if you want to be, well, doubling alpha would make your experiment less strict. So if you want to have like, you know, the same level of strictness across a one-tailed and a two-tailed test on either side, then yeah, that makes sense. But typically, I like to think maybe stricter tests is better so that you can confirm that yes, there is a difference. But I, can, I can't think of a context or a situation right now, but there might be situations that, you know, you just want to see that there's yes, some difference and then compare it to that. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Uh, sorry, it took me a while to, to get to that and understand what that was, but yeah. Um, cool. Any, I don't think there's any other questions, right? All right. Um, let's move on to type 1 and type 2 errors. So type 1 and type 2 errors. In statistical testing, everything is based on like a probability or a statistical significance. And so therefore, there are situations where we, you know, reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have and vice versa. So just like I mentioned with like p-values, having like a test statistic that has a p-value of like 0 0.05 means that there's still a 5% chance that, you know, this happened just coincidentally and there isn't really an effect. So therefore, you sort of, we call that a type 1 error. Type 1 error is a false positive because we have said that there is an effect when there really isn't because um, it's the same probability that something has occurred by chance and just by coincidence, so it would be a false positive. So when you're setting up a test, sometimes um, even, and this is also before you calculate any test statistics, um, you would like to know what your type one and type two errors are um, before you conduct the test so that you know, you know what risks you have. So a type one error is always equal to alpha. Um, if you set your alpha at 0 0.05, your probability of making a type 1 error is going to be 0 0.05 just because, you know, by the nature of, of, um, what, the P, of what the alpha means, means that, like, you have a 5% chance that, you know, you're going to make your conclusion just by coincidental data. And the opposite will be a type 2 error. Um, type 2 error is calculated slightly differently, but type 2 error is when there is a false negative. Um, when you when you did not reject the null hypothesis when you should have. Um, some, for, some, for most people, I think it helps to think of it as like false positives as type 1 error and false negatives as type 2 error. And just remember that rejecting the null hypothesis is the positive case. I'm not sure if that's less or more confusing, but, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at type 1 and type 2 errors more in depth in, I think, I believe Tuesday's slide deck, we have that. Um, so type 2 error is opposite of type 1 error, as I mentioned, is failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false, so false negatives. And now probability of type 2 error is measured by beta. And so with beta, we actually bring in something else called the power of a test. Um, this is the last slide that I have here. Not to like cliffhanger you guys, but we're going to talk about power of a test in the next study group. But basically, um, power of a test, one minus beta, which we'll talk more about what that means on Tuesday. Um, and whether you have a higher alpha or beta depends on context. Um, why I still talk about this today is because um, in your, not this upcoming project, but in future projects, you are going to have to choose between whether you would rather make uh, false positives or false negatives. And it really depends on context. Like for example, um, with these COVID, uh, COVID tests, right, would you rather have false positives or false negatives? Often it's a trade-off, um, and we'll see why it's a trade-off um, on Tuesday. Um, but in the context of a COVID test, would you rather have false negatives or, fal or false positives? Like, would you rather have COVID and not know and go around spreading it? Or on the safe side, have a false positive, not actually have it, but you're still taking precautions. So something like that, if you're testing for disease, usually false positives are preferred, and then they would usually um, um, construct their tests in a way to minimize false negatives. Um, so thinking about 
statistics and also like modeling in context is super important because of that. Um, in different contexts, you might want to do false negatives. I think one example would be like if something is spam or not, maybe. So if something is spam and let's say spam is a, is a positive case because usually you're detecting spam. So would you rather have something sent to your spam folder when it's not actually spam or something spam be in your inbox when it is spam? And that would be a case where you would prefer false negatives. I don't know if that was like too many double negatives in, in a scenario, but just think about it. <laughs> not super important to like remember the definitions for these, but just think about like, you know, false positives and false negatives, different scenarios you would prefer different ones. Um, but cool, this is the last slide that I have here. Any, any overall questions? The power of the test, that's different than statistical power, correct? Um, is, isn't statistical power when you do like multiple trials, say like multiple clinical trials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so the power of the test is actually um, figuring out, you know, the one minus type two error of when you're do when you are going to be doing tests over and over again. Um, so we'll talk about that more. I think there's material on that in section 15. And if I'm not wrong, a little bit in 16, but mostly 15, yeah. But yeah, power of a test is something that you would, like imagine you have a scenario where um, you're gonna be, I don't know, measuring, yeah, I guess the effectiveness of a drug. Um, given that you have everything set up, the power of the test is done through simulations. Um, and there's a lab that actually walks you through like the hard coded simulations. I would, uh, I would honestly like suggest just copying over the code just to see like how that works when you change different values. Um, so yeah, I don't want to go too much into that, but yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Um, cool. Any mm -hmm. other questions? Uh, excuse me. Then should we exactly consider both tails of our uh, distribution. Mm, like when should you do a two-tail test? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So usually it does depend on like the situation, right? So a situation in which you'll consider it two-tailed is when you don't know whether you're testing for an increase or decrease. So in this scenario with this drug, um, they're not absolutely certain that um, this drug will decrease blood pressure. There, I mean, there, there's a chance that they like did something wrong and like it actually increased blood pressure. So because of that, they're testing for a difference, not an increase or, de or a decrease. Um, in contrast, something like this example, and also the fact that they said that um, they did this with the goal of improving sales performance, that implies that they're testing for an increase. So therefore it's a one-tailed test versus two-tailed. That help? Yes, thank you. Awesome, you're welcome. Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to know about like Cohen's D and the overlapping probability of superiority stuff? Because I'm not sure how they're all related to one another. Yeah, um, there will be actually, it is in Tuesday's material, but I'll send out a resource that shows, that has like an interactive thing that shows the relationship between all of that. So let me actually, I can maybe like find it right now and just show that, but we don't have to know like how to calculate it. Um, so this is Tuesday's, if it would load, this is Tuesday's slide deck where we'll talk, where we're gonna be talking about statistical power. And I have linked, is it this one? There we go. I have linked here the relationship between power, alpha, sample size, and the num uh, sample size and what and Cohen's d. Yeah, so you'll sort of see like the difference and the relationship between all of them. Um, and what I was talking about earlier with with like you know power of a test and how you can determine that. Um, this calculation is done through the simulation of which the code I talked about, which is in one of the lessons, and I'll for it as well. Um, I'll, share I'll share this one out just so you 
you guys can like play with it before Tuesday's study group. I think it's um, it's helpful for some people just to see like, all right, if I'm lowering power, what? How do the other values change? Um, but yeah, you'll sort of see what that means. I think what's confusing right now for some people is that like, what is this alternate hypothesis value? And that we'll talk about um, that we'll talk about also on Tuesday, and if not Wednesday. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I will say like stuff like power of a test, um, cal or at least calculating part of the test and Cohen's D, those parts are a little bit less relevant for data science, but important to know because, you know, it's also still related to uh, type two error, which I mean, the fact that type two errors are false negatives is still kind of important for us to like be able to interpret. So I would say like this information is in our curriculum just to support us knowing what a type two error is. Awesome. Um, let's see. Let me stop the recording here. Any last questions? Um, I just had a question. I think you mentioned a day or so ago that you were going to have a session on Monday. Yeah. What was mm -hmm. that about? Oh, yeah. So if we go to the homeroom, um, on Monday, I'll be doing an extra section on solving probability questions. Um, so I've actually already linked a slide deck. And this slide deck has like all the questions that I will be going through. So if you plan on attending that, and this is optional, this is really just like me walking through how I would solve probability questions um, and also like answering any questions about probability itself. Um, and also I'm going to talk about the binomial distribution. So this I would say is optional. Um, but yeah, if anyone's interested to like maybe if you want to prepare beforehand, this is the material that I'll be going through. Um, if there are specific questions that you maybe came across in your lab that you would want me to talk about as well, just send it to me and let me know and I can, I can include it or maybe switch out a question if it's similar. But yeah, that's Monday and it's going to be Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, when we did the two tail tests, mm -hmm. the, look at the hypothesis, you used mu. Is there a reason why we use mu instead of x bar? Um, usually mu, I don't think there's a big difference. I don't know if anyone who's like more into statistics knows better, but I don't think there's a difference between using mu and x bar. I think because, he, um, I think maybe in the lesson they had used mu, which is why I use mu, but I, there, there is no difference if you were to use x bar either, in my opinion. But I don't know if anyone who's like gotten more stats experience knows a better, has a better answer. Well, if you're using a two sample t test, aren't you assuming that like you randomly selected your groups, your x bar in this should be relatively the same as the mu, isn't it supposed to be that way? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So I guess like if you're thinking about like what we're doing this test for and if like these samples are supposed to be representative of a population that has gotten the test and not gotten the test um, and because of that you might want to keep your hypothesis as, as mu since mu is traditionally for like population parameters whereas s is not s but uh, x bar is for sample. Um, I don't know what the implications of using the other one or the other are. I think, I mean, it's just a letter. I don't know if anyone's going to come at me for that. But, um, but yeah, that's, those, that's my opinion. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Awesome. I'm going to stop the recording because I do have a couple of announcements for regarding the rest of the phase.